Yes, thank you everybody for being here today and uh, I would like to welcome both the students of my lectures uh, but also the master students of our national master program in criminology and police science. It's a pleasure to have you all here and uh, it's also an honor for me to have somebody here today as a very special guest uh, who has a story to tell which for sure will surprise some of you, will have an impact, I hope, of most to most of you because the story he will tell us has to do with justice, has to do with police work and has to do with miscarriage of justice. And uh, this aspect of miscarriage of justice is an area of criminology which is and has been really been the, sus the subject of research. Perhaps somebody can close the doors behind us so that we have a little bit more noise, less noise here. So I'm proud and happy that today we are not able only to talk about this problem, but that we are also able to have somebody with us who might we call an eyewitness. Fernando Bermudez, following his wrongful conviction for murder, Fernando served for over 18 years in New York prisons until he was proven innocent in 2009. All in all, it took 11, 11 appeals to prove his actual innocence and to regain his freedom at the age of 40. Together with Pro Bono Association, the German Pro Bono Association, we have succeeded in bringing him to Germany. And I want to thank those pro bono people, but also I want to say a special thank you to Babette Stangier, who has the idea to bring Fernando to Germany, and she will also be his guide for the coming days. For nearly 15 years, Babette has been involved with the American, Amer American justice system, particularly in cases dealing with the death penalty. Her life changed when she saw a prison complex in Florida that carried out executions. This had an immediate and lasting effort on her, and she has been since then in constant contact with prisoners on death row in Texas, helping and supporting and networking with them to provide them with contacts in the outside world. She has invested a lot of her personal money for books, paper, and pencil for these inmates, and even more valuable, her time by visiting these people who are often forgotten by the rest of the world. I also want to thank Andreas Ruch and all the other people from my chair for organizing and arranging this visit trip. After starting here in Bochum, Fernando will travel to un universities and what in my opinion is especially important to police colleges in Greifswald, Berlin, Passau, Tübingen, Wiesbaden and finally Freiburg. Fernando's conviction was based on illegal identification procedures and misconduct by both the police and the prosecutor. In the end, the state even admitted that its star witness had committed perjury. A journalist, a lawyer, and former detectives helped to prove his innocence by working pro bono free of charge. Now a free man, Fernando is determined to bring justice to the judicial system that took nearly two decades of his life. I want the world to know what happened to me so this doesn't happen to anyone else. That's what he said. Fernando was 22 when he was convicted of murdering a teen in New York City. The most damning evidence against him, his photo, which was misidentified by five teenage witnesses. 
The youngsters who put him behind bars later recounted their testimony, however, saying that prosecutors and police had pressured them into pinning Permudus as the killer. There was no evidence to prove such allegations. Eyewitness testimonies are the primary source of evidence in cases with no forensic evidence. Our German students know the difference between Personen and Sachbeweis. But eyewitness misidentifications are the number one cause of wrongful convictions in the US and other common themes that run through these cases are racial issues, invalid or improper forensic science, overzealous police and prosecutors, and not qualified defense counsels. So the topic of today is of importance both for coming lawyers, for law students, and also for police officers. We cannot ignore these reasons as they continue to challenge our criminal justice system. Fernando, thank you for coming together with your nice wife to Germany to share your story. We are happy that you are with us and that you are ready to talk about your case and life after release. Thank you for coming. Danke, Professor Felt. <laughs> Professor Andreas, Babette, and my wife for helping to make today possible. Guten Tag. Ich bin Zaire Glücklich hier zu sein. My name is Fernando Bermudez, incarcerated for over 18 years, knocked down by fate, but standing today proud, happy, and determined to make a difference out of my life from something so bad that happened so long ago. I welcome you all today to this very important lecture. Proud and happy to be in Deutschland, a population of over 80 million people. Germany proper, the largest Western European country and an economic leader in the European community. Like the United States, we share similarities. We share similarities in that me being from America, from which I bid you welcome, Germany helped create the English language along with French influences. Germany having also a judicial system. But there are differences within the American criminal justice system compared to the German criminal justice system. In the United States, America is responsible for instituting justice as well as Germany is in its federal country. Germany, however, has a single national criminal code, a criminal code of national procedure and a much more unified court system. The police and prosecutor are state level rather than local agencies, and the prosecutor in Germany, unlike America, is not an elected official, but a civil servant operating within a hierarchical system. There is no death penalty in Germany, unlike America. There is no grand jury in Germany, unlike America. There is also no sentences for all major and minor crimes that are considerably lower than in the United States. In addition, Germany does not conduct a trial using a jury, and the trial process itself is very different from that in the United States. The judge, rather than the lawyers, 
organizes the evidence and asks most of the questions. The prosecutor and defense counsel are allowed to only ask questions only when the judge has finished. And the decision as to whether the additional witnesses will be called is up to the judge. Now, despite these differences, the similarity that I want to deliver today is that the German criminal justice system, like the American criminal justice system, is a human instrument and therefore vulnerable to mistakes. Because as a human instrument, errors make from human undertakings. In the summer of 1991, my life seemed full of promise. I was about to enter the medical profession. Growing up in Washington Heights, Upper Manhattan, New York City, at the time and place, seven million people in New York City. I had high hopes of making my family and society proud because I was about to enter the medical profession that fall. But I was in for a rude awakening at the happiest time of my life that summer. The medieval Germans had a proverb that says, Schatat Luft macht frei. The city air will set you free. And indeed, that summer, I felt free. Free and footloose as I was enjoying the night of August 3rd with my friends, celebrating my enrollment in college, driving in my father's car, oblivious to what would happen to me. The kaleidoscope of culture in Times Square of 42nd Street dazzled us with the colors and the melting pot that is American culture. As we drove from place to place, enjoying the nightlife, of our promising youth. Yet, the city air that had set us free that night was also about to take it away. A gun was placed to my head on August 6, 1991, two days later after that joyous, fateful day. And that's because unknown to any of us. There had been an incident in which 16-year-old Ephraim Lopez had been punched at a nightclub. Ephraim Lopez, punched in the nightclub, was embarrassed. He was angry. He wanted to seek revenge after being punched. And so, when the nightclub closed, he told friends from his West 90s of Upper Manhattan neighborhood who had punched him. And outside, in the nighttime air of Greenwich Village, Raymond Blount, who had punched him, came out with his friends. And then from Lopez, by all accounts, in judicial proceedings that would follow, told somebody from his crowd who had punched him. Ephraim Lopez and his friends started attacking Raymond Blount and his friends. A melee ensued in which an estimated 70 Latinos and blacks went blows to blows. A jeep blocked escape. Bottles flew. Fists connected with faces. And in that confusion of nighttime conditions, a shot rang out. Echoing, ricocheting, hitting different lives beyond the life of Raymond Blount, who fell dead and was carried to the hospital by his three best friends. The bullet that killed Raymond Blount ricocheted two days later and hit my life and hit my parents' life and hit the lives of my wife and so many others who will be affected by this case. 
And that's because after that incident, Ephraim Lopez was arrested and he told the police and prosecutor who actually committed the crime, who actually was the person who came and defended him. A person who he told to police and prosecutor was named Wu Lu. Yet the police and prosecutor didn't care to investigate his key leads. They were sort of stuck with what psychologists call tunnel vision, in that they were focused on the evidence that they already had gathered, which was basically nothing except an illegal identification procedure. This illegal identification procedure involved the teenage witnesses who had been attacked that night being placed in a small room and being allowed to look at photographs. In that process, a 17-year-old young lady selected my picture after selecting two others as someone who looked familiar. Illegally, she took that picture and shared it with the other witnesses, thereby contaminating the situation, but also creating a psychological interplay in which by her sharing the picture and telling the other teenage witnesses that I look like the person, they too decided to say, yeah, he does look like the person. The police and prosecutor in what is the most important time of an investigation, which is 48 hours before leads grow cold, a window of opportunity, if you will, should have stopped the investigation right then and there when Ephraim Lopez, who had been arrested, had told them who committed the crime. Instead, the prosecutor offered Ephraim Lopez a deal. And this deal was, that if he falsely testified against me, he will relieve himself, escape charges as an accessory to murder. Ephraim Lopez took it. He was 16 years old, facing 25 years to life in prison, had been in police custody for 27 hours as a 16-year-old who had already been to prison for the young teenage years of his life already at that point. And the situation could have been prevented there also because Ephraim Lopez, as well as the other teenage witnesses, gave them some important key leads which were as different as night is today. And that is, all the witnesses said that the suspect who they believed they saw stood 5'10", and weighed 165 pounds. At the time, I'm 6'2", weighing 220 pounds or more, seriously bodybuilding. Small wonder why the cops told me to sit down. I'm told to sit down in a bench, and I'm given a number, and I'm next to police officers in civilian clothing. I could tell they're police officers because they have the police badges underneath their shirts and you could see the badges sort of under the summer t-shirts. I also know because they're joking and kidding around with each other as to how they have to be doing this type of stuff. Something is wrong. It's feeling like I have a bullseye over my head and I'm being selected. And the things grow worse because I insist to the prosecutor, I am an innocent man. I had nothing to do with this. I don't know what you're talking about. What murder are you talking about? I wasn't at the nightclub. I was with my friends. My friends came to the precinct, supported my testimony. And even three friends of the deceased who had carried Raymond Blount dead to the hospital had said in the lineup, this is not the guy who shot our best friend. So one would think that at that point there would be 
a stalling of an investigation. But that doesn't happen. That doesn't happen because I continue insisting my innocence and for my troubles I'm sent to Rikers Island. Rikers Island is a horrible prison. It is the largest penal colony in the world, housing 14,000 inmates, which is half the population of your university, which is about 30,000. Half that population of 14,000 yelling and screaming inmates, cutting and stabbing each other, and I'm placed into this madness just because I say I'm innocent. And I tell the judge that at my arraignment. My faith is that despite what I'm enduring at Rikers Island, being strip searched naked in front of a cell of men, saying, <laughs> and being attacked just because I want to use the prison phone, and there's people trying to control it. And if I try to use it, there's a problem. All of that I'm enduring. But my faith is telling me that if I continue telling the truth, my patience will persevere. In Germany, Unklaga is a prosecutor's charging document leading to towards what Americans call an indictment. The prosecutor secures an indictment against me while I'm at Rikers Island. And I don't get to see a grand jury because I'm not told. Yet, my next hope is that at a trial, my innocence will be revealed because I'm determined to tell the truth and so are my friends. German prosecutors do not conduct preliminary hearings as complaints of violations of law. Rather, the judge receives a written file for all the evidence when charges are filed. Unlike America, disclosure of a prosecution's case to defense in advance of a trial in Germany is virtually automatic. In American jurisprudence, it is not. The prosecutor hid evidence that could have proved my innocence. He did not disclose the evidence, unlike German authorities would do. Instead, he turned it over right when my trial began. So my defense attorney, who my parents had to sell their car for to be able to afford, could not review the evidence, because it was boxes of evidence right when my trial began. Nor did the judge cooperate in this case. He did not allow my defense attorney to review this evidence, which included Ephraim Lopez's videotaped statement mentioning my innocence, which if a jury would have seen, would have helped support my innocence before them. In Germany, a prosecutor has the responsibility to investigate a case, unlike the police department. They may investigate together, but the prosecutor has a lead role in investigating a case. Had the investigator stopped my proceedings and investigated, then he would have found evidence that would have proved my innocence. But he didn't do that. He failed his ethical and professional responsibility. In fact, he violated it as a slap to human dignity to myself and society by offering the teenage witnesses, all of whom have been arrested, I would learn, a plea deal in which if they falsely testified against me, even though they had told the police and prosecutor they were not sure that I was the person, that their own criminal charges, unrelated to the instant case, that those charges will be dropped. So now we have a motivation, a purposeful drive to get witnesses to purposely identify a person who is knowingly innocent. And so I go to trial. 
And Ephraim Lopez, had this been a German court, would not have been susceptible to being charged in accessory to murder because in German courts, a juvenile cannot be charged as an adult. But in American courts, a juvenile can. In fact, we have juveniles in death row in the past. This witness, Ephraim Lopez, moved forward with his false testimony against me. And German law, like American law, divides offenses into categories. Das Verbrechen, or the German equivalent of a felony in my case, was the charge of murder. That of taking a human life with willful misconduct and disregard for that life out of that altercation that happened on August 3rd and 4th. Yet I didn't do it. Yet I didn't do it. And so my arrest during my trial continued. My unter such unk haft involving long-term detention continued at Rikers. And I went to trial. And I took the stand. And all these witnesses lied. And it didn't matter. It didn't matter because the lies were so much against me and I had no opportunity to prove it based on the disadvantage from the prosecutor of what he did in turning over the evidence late that I was about to enter the next serious and challenging predicament of my life, surviving New York State maximum security prison. A place where I went and now I entered a situation in which I was found guilty of murder and I couldn't believe it. As my head was shaven and my civilian clothes were stripped and I was given green clothing with the numbers 92, 83, 25. I was a prisoner of war now, so to speak. And the only way that I was going to get out of prison was if I proved my innocence in an appeals process. The appeals process in which after my hopped fair hunt lunk, after my trial began, was a situation in which now I hoped that the judge's review of my case, which is considered air earth nunk de humterfall forens, would result in a situation in which the judge would review the evidence and see the mistakes for what they were, which was a pack of lies. And that was because, ladies and gentlemen, we began an investigation, an investigation which the prosecutor had failed to conduct. This investigation began because witnesses had lied and admitted it to attorneys who started working for free, to a former homicide detective who took my case and uncovered the fact that Ephraim Lopez, for example, did in fact know this guy named Wu Lu, was in fact roommates with him, proving the motivations as to why they would defend each other and why Wu Lu would come and shoot him after his, as they say in street terms, his boy had been beat up. But unfortunately, the appeals process is more complicated than just simply telling the truth, being patient, and dealing with the pain and suffering on prison life, which up until that point involved living in a six by nine foot cell with thousands of inmates charged with murder, serial murder, some of the worst crimes imaginable, some with life without parole, meaning they're never coming home, some with such a bad attitude that if you're not careful with how you conduct yourself, you can get killed by them, as was happening right before me. People getting killed, people committing suicide. Speaking of which, I was getting denied so many appeals that I started considering what Ernest, Ernest Hemingway called the big way out. 
And that suicide ideation was something that I had to overcome with faith and hope that the truth would never prevail despite losing so many appeals. I started learning the law, and I started communicating with more attorneys who could help me. And these attorneys pledged that they would not stop until I was released, until I was proven innocent. And I was hopeful that that would happen. I was hopeful because for years I had questioned, as would a journalist. I would say, Vo, Vi, Van, Vas, Varum, there, like a journalist. Who, what, when, where, and how? Who were all the people involved in this case? How would the incongruous puzzle be put together into a coherent picture that a judge would understand and finally vindicate into my exoneration? I remained patient, persevering, and writing as many attorneys as I could, surviving in a cell, typing, hunched, as many letters as I could so somebody could help, so somebody could hear my cries, so another journalist could write a story because I'm losing appeal after appeal. And I have to fight for love. I have to fight for the love of my wife and children who are enduring this with me. My children are starting to ask, when are you coming home, Daddy? Why doesn't the truth matter? And I have no answer except that it will prevail. Please be patient. Your father will come home. I continue edu educating myself, earning a college degree in prison. And I develop an idea to support my wife and children who are suffering so much. My wife is facing homelessness at times. She has hand injuries which doesn't allow her to work because they require more surgeries. And so I start buying clothing wholesale and I start retailing it in prison. I start selling clothes so that I can get cigarettes and stamps and any items I can to exchange and send home to my wife so that she can exchange it for actual cash to pay the bills, to help them survive and get one less problem out of my head. But I remain in prison. I remain in prison. But Frederick von Schiller spoke about great souls who suffer in silence. But I couldn't suffer in silence. I had to scream my innocence. And therefore, I continued writing letter after letter until my persistent attitude paid off with a new team of attorneys who by 2007 came to my aid and used the evidence that the previous attorney was not able to succeed. The philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer spoke about the fact that every truth goes through three stages before it is recognized. First, it is ridiculed, which up until then had happened, based upon me getting denied. Second, it is opposed, which up until then was quite true, since I had been denied 10 appeals, ladies and gentlemen. 10 appeals in both state and federal courts. And third, Schopenhauer said, and then is regarded as self-evident. The judge that I got was a new judge by 2008, the following year. I had written so many letters that my case became a national situation in which court TV 
Currently, True TV had aired an hour-long documentary. In addition to the New York Times placing my case front page, causing rallies in lower Manhattan to try to get my case reopened, along with so many other news programs that had helped bring continued attention to my case. But this new judge, unlike the past judge, had allowed the prosecution an opportunity to investigate after they requested an opportunity to investigate. And that was because, I believe, not because he was being a nice guy or, we, or because he was being favorable to the prosecution, but because I think he was being fair enough to allow them to hang themselves. Hang themselves to prove once and for all, by their own account and their own ignorance, what Schopenhauer said as the third element, which is making my innocence self-evident. That's because the prosecution began an investigation after so much publicity had opened up my case, and the lawyers I had came from Washington, D.C., New York, and New Jersey law firms, some of the best attorneys in America. And when they investigated, they investigated the key leads that Ephraim Lopez had told them nearly 18 years ago. And they investigated that Wu Lu, this individual in question, actually did exist. He was roommates with Ephraim Lopez, had fled the state right after the murder, was living under a false name, traveling throughout different parts of the United States, had been arrested several times, and then, when asked to verify his whereabouts on August 3rd and 4th on the night of the shooting, he gave an alibi that turned out to be not true. The prosecution tried to hide this from us when the judge said, no more. We are going to proceed because Fernando Bermudez has evidence to demonstrate that he is actually innocent. And they tried to suppress that. They tried to prevent that from happening. But my attorneys did not allow that to happen. The judge began a proceeding. At the 11th hour, after I had had an 11 day trial with 11 witnesses in my favor in which all the witnesses came forward and revealed the reasons why they lied. And I couldn't believe it because here now these witnesses were telling the truth unlike the lies before that they were telling. And it seemed like something different was happening. It seemed that I was about to enjoy, to prevail with a change in my life as I was finishing my bachelor's degree right before I went to court. After the two-week proceeding in which the detectives came forward and couldn't remember their testimony, one came in like he was drunk. A detective who was in charge of this homicide investigation, whose first case in 1991 had resulted in another case getting wrongfully incarcerated of an innocent man, and him getting admonished by the appellate courts. A case in which the prosecutor now seemed nervous. Wow. I looked at the court proceedings as they unfolded before me. The prosecutor's case, which seemed like a fortress of lies and had withstood the constant hammering of the truth for so many years, was now crumbling like a sandcastle with a wave of undeniable truth. 
So the proceedings seemed like they had went so well. Or had they? Or had they? Ladies and gentlemen, the odds of me winning an appeal at this point were so remote and painstakingly psychological that people were saying that I was crazy, that I was insane for not accepting a plea offer. I was offered, before this proceeding began, a plea offer in which if I pled guilty, the prosecutor offered, then I would be allowed to go free if I accepted a less charge of murder rather than the current murder charge that I had. In other words, they, they said, accept the guilty plea and you can go free. Time served. I refused that. I refused that deal with the devil. I refused to sell my soul in that Faustian bargain in exchange for my freedom, which would not give me the power that I sought. And so I rejected that. But people said, dude, if you lose this appeal, you're going to spend the rest of your life in prison. If you see a parole board, for which I was scheduled to see a parole board in 2014, they would, accept, they would expect me to say I was guilty of the crime in order to release me. But I said, I don't care if I die in prison. I'm going to die for the truth until my truth is accepted as self-evident. And so when I went to court, I had to have the faith, the faith that God would prevail and that the truth would set me free. And so when I went to court, the court was packed with people. And it was quiet as reporters were with their cameras and reporters were furiously scribbling. And there was an anticipation, a hushed suffocation, yet a form of pin drop quiet because something big was about to happen. And the judge said, will the defendant, Fernando Bermudez, in the case of people versus Fernando Bermudez in the state of New York, please rise? I did. And my knees were shaking. I was nervous. I was nervous because he was this judge. This judge, though, who in one of the few American courtrooms still had in God we trust. And I did trust in God. And that judge silenced everyone and said, I hereby declare Fernando Bermuda's innocent. And there was a punctuating sigh of relief as if everyone was holding their breath and was finally able to breathe. For me, it felt like someone took a plastic bag off the top of my head after 18 years because I could finally breathe as well. I was breathing as if born like a newborn baby as I cried in a way that I never cried in my life, in my attorney's chest. Shortly thereafter, I'm freed into a world that has changed so dramatically. A world in which in 1991 up until 2009, on that beautiful day, I had gone through several governors, several mayors, several presidents, from George Bush Sr. all the way to the first black president, President Barack Obama, to so much that had changed. The technology, cell phones which were this big were now this small. And I was given one and I caught it. And I held it upside down trying to talk to my family. And I was amazed. Somebody threw me some jeans, and they said, hey, put on these skinny jeans, that's the style. I said, skinny jeans? What? So I put them on, and I couldn't get them on. So I hopped into them like it was a potato sack race, you know? And they were tight, they felt like, le like leotards. I mean, I felt like a ballerina about to pirouette, you know? And the dude said, 
my friend said, that's the style, dude. That's what's happening in New York City. I said, nah, nah. I'm not uh, Mikhail Baryshnikov uh, about to do a dance with these leotards. You know, so I had to get used to that. The food was incredible. I couldn't stop eating. I just kept eating and eating and eating. I, it's like I was going to float away, it felt like, from so much eating. I had to come to a society in which I had to learn to drive again. I had to get my license. I felt strange even holding money in my pocket. When I went into a department store, I was confused because there was all these colors and selections. I had, I had studied personal finance in prison, and I took it to the hilt in that Every little decision was based on an economic analysis, even if it meant a difference between 25 and 50 cents. That's how stuck up I was on the conditioning of life in prison and the difficulty that I had in adjusting back to society. But the gestalt of it all, as they say in psychology, the whole picture was that I was an individual who after 6,700 days of living in prison, where gun towers were in the yard, controlling movements of every prisoner to make sure that no more killings happened or fights, where after so many years of running the prison yard, top speed, just so I could relieve my anxiety my shaky hands, in order so I could sleep. The fact was that I had left prison, but prison had not left me. I was still used to that prison life. I was still thinking like an inmate, number 92, 83, 25, waking up at 5.30 in the morning to still be counted as if to conduct, to fulfill the prison census. I was waking up pacing outside of my bed, walking back and forth like a caged leopard. And my wife would tell me, Fernando, you're not in prison anymore. Get back to bed. I had to get used to trying to sensitize myself as a father to three children, let alone a husband to my wife. My children, aged 21, 11, and 7, were a whole other angle that I had to deal with in dealing with the anxiety that I was experiencing. My eldest daughter, to start an indication of what it means to be wrongfully incarcerated and the impact it has on families, didn't think I loved her because I was dealing with my issues. I was acting strange. I was washing my underwear in the shower because it was still like I was still in prison. When I came home, her little dog, which reminds me of the little dog from The Wizard of Oz, Toto, cute little Maltese, fluffy white dog. I mean, I like the dog, he's cute, but it seemed like he sensed my anxiety. So when I tried to, to, to pet him, he would bite me, you know, and I would have to back up. And then when I would walk him, it felt like an issue of me feeling like there were still prison towers and there was still barbed wire fence. So we had to get rid of the dog. And my daughter thought I didn't love her, but she didn't know that her daddy had to try to get used to society again. And so she got married and left the home. And I had to deal with that, and today we've patched things up. I had to deal with my daughter Carissa, who's a fashionista. She's the best dressed girl at Morris Street School where we live. Every day I take my little kids to school and I have to get used to her wanting to dress. I had to get used to listening to Katy Perry, <laughs> to Selena Gomez. And I did, because I did love her like a love song, baby. <laughs> you know? So getting used to her and then I had to get used to my son my son is transfixed on these action figures called Transformers. Now, if anyone knows about Transformers, I'm not just talking about the movie, I'm talking about the action figures. And try put, putting them things together from robot to airplane to car. 
I have enough problems and confusion in my head, and I got to deal with transformers? Then he wants me to do it while I'm learning how to drive still. Bad move as I approach a pole at 50 miles per hour, you know? So I have to deal with that. Then I have to deal with him saying to me every night, scratch my back. He wants me to scratch his back every night. I don't mind doing it, but dude, I'm already wiping you every time you use the bathroom. Now you want me to scratch your back? You know, all these are the things that I had to deal with and getting used to. And they all encompass the gestalt of post-traumatic stress disorder and the difficulties that it takes for an individual who's been released in adjusting to society again. These difficulties involve today the acknowledgement that I'm still suffering in prison, as if in prison, and that I need psychological help, which is why I see a psychologist today. I see a psychologist every week to help me understand the difficulties that I'm experiencing as someone who's been released from society. My parents, I came home, they suffered so much, my mother and my father. My father began drinking. He has manic depression and that made it worse, his son being incarcerated, me being the eldest and so forth. And I came home to two parents who didn't even recognize their son, who had changed for better and worse, not accepting the fact that I'm a man on a mission and that I'm a man on a mission to make an impact in society today because I don't want what happened to me to happen to any of you or to anyone else in the world. I got out of prison and I started fighting to abolish the death penalty in Connecticut. I started meeting state senators and I started writing articles and I said, please, don't let the mistake of someone getting me put to death fall on your hands. Work with me and my organization to help abolish the death penalty in Connecticut. And in April 2012, after my last testimony before the state senate judiciary, Connecticut abolished the death penalty. As a result, I was invited with the police commissioner to Rome, Italy. And I stood at the Roman Colosseum speaking to acknowledge Connecticut having abolished the death penalty, to acknowledge the other European countries like yourselves who have taken the important next step of abolishing the death penalty and the risk that an innocent person can be incarcerated. I've become an advocate and my parents didn't understand that. They thought I didn't love them. They didn't understand that I'm trying to be a husband to my wife who suffered. To my children, who to this day still cry if I'm gone too long. These are some of the changes that they didn't recognize in me coming out of prison. Even though I was doing better things than ever in my life. And I do it because in America, for example, our criminal justice system is so imperfect. For example, we have 303 DNA-based exonerations. That's just on DNA alone since 1989 until recently. 303 innocent people from both death row and life imprisonment have been released just through DNA. With over a thousand in America, being released since 1989 without DNA, like me. Without any evidence other than mistaken eyewitness identification, which began my problem. Mistaken eyewitness identification is the leading cause of all wrongful convictions. It accounts for 75% of these over 1,000 wrongful incarcerations in America. In fact, we've had over 143 innocent people released from death row since 1989. From death row, hours away from almost being killed. 
That's why I support the case of George McFarland, who Babette champions. A man who sits on death row today, waiting a decision for his freedom, for his justice and his human rights to be upheld. Texas death row right now, hanging in limbo, waiting a judge's decision. Because I don't want George McFarland to die. I don't want anyone to die. And I don't want any innocent person in my country as well as yours or anywhere else to experience a wrongful incarceration. I continue fighting because of our imperfect criminal justice system. And I want to encourage you that as law students, as criminal justice students, you can make a difference. I learned in my life through the pain and suffering that I experienced that with determination and focus, I achieved an accomplishment against painstaking odds. And that was proving my innocence because I continued fighting. The profession that all of you are achieving, the education, will allow you to all serve as agents of change. This university here in the Industrial Valley with having the distinction of being the first modern university in Germany since World War II gives you the opportunity, ladies and gentlemen, to be agents of change. A catalyst that can transform the lives as other people who cared about me transformed mine. You can help save an innocent person. You can do any number of things through volunteering and using your professions as lawyers, as any type of law enforcement agents or just human beings in general. It doesn't matter who's in this room. In knowing that in our imperfect criminal justice system, we can make a difference. That's what I have to believe every day. I'm just one person speaking to you today. But I stand before a cause with a multitude of people who believe the same and are seeking to help improve our criminal justice system. I want to urge you that with whatever happens in life, whatever throws you down, you can overcome adversity. You think you're having a bad day today or was it yesterday? Or maybe even tomorrow you may think you're having a bad day? I spent over 6,700 days in prison, and I overcame it through education, through hope, determination, and purpose. I had to use my spirit to kick ass. And I encourage you to do the same, because you can do it. You can overcome adversity. Despite the differences between German and American law, the similarity we share is that we all, today, can stand for the human rights of every human being as a public safety and human safety issue. We can uphold as we go on our journeys and depart and perhaps meet again in the roads of life one day, knowing that in making a difference, we make a difference in ourselves. Changing the life of someone is so valuable. And in realizing the differences that we have in our criminal justice systems, the similarities that we share in upholding the importance of every human being being innocent from prison and avoiding a wrongful arrest is that today and tomorrow and forever, we can live and go to sleep knowing that we've made a difference. And that will not only honor your country, but it will honor all of humanity. And you will see that that will be one of the best parts of existence and satisfaction that you have had in your life. I encourage you to embrace this idea, to deal with this self-evident reality, and you too will be blessed beyond measure in transforming the life of another and in the process of yourselves. Danke, Deutschland.
You want the mic? No, no, keep it, keep it. I think this was the uh, loudest and the longest interview I've ever had. I think it's. It was a great um, pleasure to listen to you, um, to your vivid and very intensive lecture and your experiences you have earned over all these years with, with all these challenges. And uh, I think it's a feeling of, of freedom that it's, it's even possible after, after such an experience you have not lost your trust into justice but also into those who will be lawyers and attorneys and police officers, or who are already police officers. You mentioned yes. that a retired police officer helped you yes. um, to prove your innocence. So I think it's a very good example of what is possible, but also what is necessary to withstand such a situation and to overcome such a situation. And I'm quite sure that uh, your wife played a quite important role uh, over these years. Okay, we have some time for, for questions, and uh, Fernando will keep his mic so uh, that he will be able to be recorded and uh, everybody can listen to his mic. Okay, go ahead. Yes. Well, let me be clear that I received no apology from the police or prosecutor or judge involved in making this such a long, drawn out, difficult situation. No apology from them. However, the, the judge who I appeared before in 2009 did apologize. He apologized on behalf of New York State. And if I wasn't clear, he said, that the prosecutor knew and should have known that he was relying upon perjured testimony, that my identification procedures were illegal and should not have happened, that the state was relying upon perjured testimony or false testimony, and they admitted it for their first time, all wrapped up into an actual innocence ruling. And he added in his parting ruling that the state of New York knows who actually committed this crime, and it's up to them to pursue this. And he added, quote, I hope for you a much better future, Mr. Bermudez. So the reaction in the judicial sense was that that type of decision made New York State, if not American, legal history. But for my community of Washington Heights, a predominantly Dominican neighborhood from which I had left was stolen from in 1991, the reaction was one of joyous celebration. As people, when I came home, blocked off the whole street and were singing and dancing, waving Fernando Bermudez's innocent shirts and yelling, justice, justicia, libertad, justice, liberty, freedom. And it was a celebration, not just for myself, my wife, and my family, et cetera, and my defense team, but for the whole com Dominican community who had been experiencing this for so long and felt a unified victory as a whole. Yes? Did you receive any kind of for your No, I have not received any compensation. In fact, when I was released, I was released with $40 of my own money after 18 years, okay? And I wasn't entitled to a psychologist. I wasn't entitled to any social services whatsoever to help me get back on my feet. Why? Because I was declared innocent versus a person who is found guilty and is released after serving their prison sentence. They are entitled to different benefits because they are still a product of the criminal justice system and therefore the system has to somehow take care of them a little bit. But what about the person who's innocent and released? 
I received nothing, which is why I have begun supporting myself through public speaking around the world. And I have also have begun two major lawsuits against New York City, which are now in the process of getting resolved. And even though millions of dollars cannot give me back my lost years, it will at least help send another message that would happen to me shouldn't happen to others to help change the laws. Yes? There was no uh, motivation at all. They, they, they couldn't find any. No, they never asked me. I mean, I didn't know anybody involved. They were like, you know, just dumbfounded. You know, like in terms of I'm telling them truth after truth and evidence and they don't have any motivation. Like at trial, a prosecutor's job is to prove motive. They couldn't prove that. After the fact, we proved it because as I pointed out, Ephraim Lopez, the state star witness, was roommate with the actual shooter. The shooter, by all accounts, had came to his aid after he had been punched in the nightclub. That proved the motive. They had a reason to defend each other. So we did the job that the prosecutor and police should have done, including proving motive. Yes. Well, I would say I'm only going backwards when I still feel like I'm in a prison cell, <laughs> you know, thinking I'm still incarcerated. I have stopped washing my underwears in the shower. I realize that I'm no longer bathing with 50 men in a prison cell, you know, in a prison uh, setting. So I've overcome some things. But I realize that there's some uh, regression to the conditioning that I experienced while incarcerated for so long. But in terms of moving forward, yes. I've crossed the finish line, and I've, I've, I'm moving forward in a way where the reality, nevertheless, is that I've only begun. I've only begun because there's so much else of the world that I need to still see. In October, it's Japan. In 2014, it's India, where I promised my wife she could ride into a lecture on an elephant. <laughs> now, let's see how many rupees that costs. <laughs> but... The fact is, ladies and gentlemen, I'm serious, and I'm continuing to work as hard as I can in America, whether it's at a local high school, whether it's attending a parent-teacher's meeting for my kids, or whether it's testifying before another legislative body, et cetera, et cetera. I've only just begun. I'm a young man. I'm 43 years old today, and sometimes I forget how old I am because life is moving so fast. I've done more with my life in three and a half years since my release than I have in the 22 years I've lived as a person before this happened to me. And if so much has already happened, what else does life hold as being pregnant with possibilities? Yes. Yes. Well, this is a cautionary tale. A cautionary tale in that let it be a lesson to anyone that if you get arrested for anything, your life can change forever. I got arrested for marijuana. And because of that, because of, you know, that changed my life. Because my picture ended up in file in police records. Now, my, case, my charge was so minor, it should not even have been there. But by mistake, it, it stayed in the system. And that young lady on that day picked out my picture, and that changed my life. 
So please, try to prevent ever being arrested because it'll put you in the system. Off with us. <laughs> Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? I love your questions. Please, don't be shy. Unfortunately not, and that's what should happen. Um, but what only happened was that the district attorney's office took it upon themselves to try to investigate but what they were trying to do in desperation was try to nail the final nail in my coffin. But that wasn't the case because they only uncovered more nails that released me from my cement tomb of prison. And that should have happened, but it didn't. And what really happened was that the judge just encouraged them to investigate. In fact, the sad part about this is that even though the prosecutor was charged by the judge himself as being improper in this case by fabricating evidence, he should be held liable as well. I would say anywhere a prosecutor is held liable for their criminal justice misconduct, we will reduce the amount of people being wrongfully incarcerated. But in America, in America, prosecutors are not being held accountable. They're not subject to lawsuits unlike the police department is. And that encourages them, I would say, to an extent, to continue doing the same mistakes, such as turning over evidence late when a person begins their trial, such as offering witnesses deals to escape their own murder charges so that they could falsely lie. And that shouldn't happen. Anybody is, is perhaps a little bit too shy to put in a question in English to, to Fernando. We have also the possibility, if anyone is too shy to speak English, to speak one or two questions to translate. There is a story behind the story. Just let me tell it. One of um, our assistants at, um, at my chair, Julian Redman, studied political science in the US before he came to Germany. And during his studies in political science, he did a paper, an exam paper, on Fernando's case. So the both met now in Bochum, uh, you cannot imagine, I mean, in Bochum, and, and Fernando <laughs> told us about Bochum and about the, uh, the pressure which is on you now because of your, in, in this uh, very famous university here. That's right. Wenn jemand auf Deutsch fragen möchte, kann der Julian das. Experts estimate that the problem is as high as 5%. That means that out of over 2.3 million people incarcerated in America today, as a leader in global incarceration, sadly, in such a modern country as America, we lead incarceration rates. That means that out of over 2.3 million we have, if the experts are right, tens of thousands of people currently wrongfully incarcerated in America today. And let's say we take an, an estimated 1%, just to be conservative, the most conservative we can be, which even some of the most conservative judges in the United States says, well, it has to at least just be 1%. Well, if it is just 1%, you still got thousands of innocent people potentially incarcerated in America today. That's a problem. That's a problem. Got it. Got it. Yes. There's a special procedure in the police office. Okay. Special procedure in Germany that we call Wahllichtbildvorlage. Okay. You can select 
the pictures. Okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, if I could pose this question, this question, as I, as I understand it, is that has any police identification procedures changed in America, or at least New York State, as a result of what happened to me? I can say that overall, there has been some changes to the extent that now, since 1991 up until the current year, it's realized in hindsight that some procedures should not be employed by the police, which are suggestive and likely to produce a bad identification procedure. For example, witnesses should not be sitting down to hide their height and weight differences. Witnesses should be made no longer to just stand together holding numbers. Instead, they should be told to walk in the room one by one. And the instructions should include in a lineup procedure or even a photo array. A photo array is when pictures are presented of various potential suspects, right? In either procedure, the police should instruct the potential witness, tell us, I should say, excuse me, the person who you see in this lineup or photo array may or may not be responsible versus what was used in my time, tell us who's responsible. Which means that if you have six people, well, it's one out of six. <laughs> Witnesses are oftentimes confused. I, as I've pointed out, mistaken eyewitness identification is the leading cause of all wrongful incarcerations in the United States. And it might be a problem in Germany as well. I dare, I dare say it is. So, this problem could be prevented if those procedures were employed, and they started employing it now. But it's not uniform. It's not happening in every precinct. Some states have happened. New York State is still lagging in certain procedures. New Jersey has started doing that. Not just because of my case, but because of the social sciences, which demonstrates the problems of mistaken eyewitness identification. New York still has a long way to go. They're in the process now of doing that. I've met with legislators in New York, privately and so forth, to see how we can change that, and we would hope that this year is going to provide those type of changes. I yes, I, I forgave them while I was in prison. I mean, let me tell you, unforgiveness is a disadvantage for any human being. If you're living with unforgiveness, oftentimes you're dealing with resentment. You're dealing with bitterness. You're dealing with a burden that kind of festers and begins like an infection until it starts rotting away at your spirit. Forgiveness takes that away. And in order for me to be productive when I was in prison, to be able to be a father to my kids, and so forth, to be an educator in prison and teaching history and being a college student and learning the law and just being a person who wasn't as miserable as everyone else around me, I had to forgive. I had to let that go and say, it's in God's hands. My justice is with God and my justice is also going to happen with the encouragement that I receive in fighting my case, in being proactive. So I had to let that go. And I even forgive the police and prosecutor who put me in prison for all these years, knowing that they should not have done that. I can forgive, but I can't forget. And that's what's important to remember. And because I don't forget, I don't forget cases that I need to continue still helping out with and advocating and even taking these long airline uh, travels to places like here because you're all worth it. You're all worth it. The person who's responsible has not been sought out, even though, like I said, he was interviewed by the prosecution's office and the evidence indicated he was guilty. It's much more of an embarrassment than a sense of justice for the prosecution to pursue his arrest. Not to mention that all the evidence they used against me no longer works against him, which is the danger. When an innocent person gets incarcerated, 
the likelihood that the suspect is found grows worse. And of course, the likelihood that a suspect, a person who actually committed the crime, can commit more crimes is even greater, such as what's happened in many cases. This person has not been apprehended. It's a mockery of justice that he has not been arrested. And it's just a shame. It's a disrespect to me, to society, and of course to the victim's family who deserved better than a case where they believe justice had been served and it never was. Okay, I would like to collect the last questions and Fernando can answer them uh, together. So I have one question over there. Uh, we, we collect okay. if you want to put down okay. the, the panel. I got it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Over there. Yes, please. your last choice to answer the questions and to, to give us another message and, and all these young people sure. some hope to, to become a good lawyer, which uh, would never be in a situation like, like yours. Right. Just so many questions now. Uh, <laughs> well, to answer, to answer the simple one, uh, there was one from over there. Uh, sorry. Well, first, let me answer your question. I remember it more clearly. <laughs> Psychologically, it, it, was, it was a mental difficulty every single day dealing with that. And I had to, again, seek to make my mind my best friend rather than my worst enemy. Because it was a torture every day, you know, mentally dealing with this. And I was very scared. I didn't know if I would wake up alive the next day because people were getting killed. Or I may wake up and some person, some de delusional person, some Dumkov, might just try to hurt me. And I didn't do anything to him. So you got people with mental issues there, you know? So I had to be very careful and I had to just navigate very carefully. And then we had the other question. Help me out here, Professor. Okay, okay. <laughs> just, just, again. Yes. Okay, got it. Um, well, they reacted in a way where they actually appreciated and admired me for the most part because I was a person who was always being a positive individual. I was helping out people who couldn't read. When it came to law work, if there was only a Spanish-speaking person and they didn't understand, then I would help them understand the English language, or I would translate in Spanish for them, because I speak Spanish. So I would help them in that way. But most importantly, my best weapon in prison was not a knife, you know, hidden in my pocket or anything like that. It was my behavior which allowed me to set an example of a different lifestyle in prison. And because I embraced education so much, people who ordinarily didn't want to read or didn't find the importance of education said, you know what? I want to be like you, man. I said, well, here's a book. Dostoevsky, Crime and Punishment. <laughs> Start on that. Well, prison is something that doesn't pass like a sneeze. You know, you got a life sentence and 24 hours feels like 48. Time crawls on hands and knees. You know, it goes real slow and, and again, 
you have to deal with your mind in being able to pass time as productively as possible to make pass, time pass fast. So you have to deal with that, that challenge, and then you have to deal with the idea of just making every day count. For me, it was whether it was learning a new word or writing another letter to a lawyer, I had to make every day a day of hope. And that's what it was. It was about creating hope every day when if you didn't, you grow depressed. Okay, last question. I think it was over there. Yeah. I have not. I have not. And, you know, I just, I feel bad that they lost their son. You know, they know I didn't do it now, and it's a shame that they haven't received justice. You know, I wish I could tell them that, but they've moved on with their life, haven't cared if justice has been served. I know if I was a family member and what happened to me happened to them, I would be requesting for the prosecutor, hey, you got a job to still do. But they haven't done that. They just moved on with their life. Absolutely. That's a good last question. Yes, and that is, I, I, I begin almost where I started, and that is with the idea of holding prosecutors accountable. If we were to hold corrupt prosecutors, let me be clear that we need laws in society. We need laws, we need prosecutors, we need police officers, we need a system of government to keep society safe in what Thomas Hobbes would call a social contract to prevent might uh, being right, because the weak, would then take, the weak would be taken advantage of by the strong. So we need laws to protect people. But it is a detriment to society when someone entrusted with that trust takes advantage and breaks the laws. We would curb or reduce wrongful incarceration if prosecutors were held accountable in America. We need that to happen. We had a man who lost his lawsuit. He won $18.5 million uh, because he made a claim that the prosecutor was corrupt, and he won it. But he lost it because in America, there's a clause, you can't sue the prosecutor, you have to sue the police department. He sued the prosecutor, and because of that, his 18 million was taken away from him. And it's happening in other cases as well. That shouldn't happen, and it's not about money either. It's just about human life, and. Nobody should lose 22 years of their life in prison. I know this man. I was just at New York University speaking or whatever, and I saw him, and it was a shame to see how he's all skinny and all just something happened to him, man. He, wow, you know, shouldn't happen, man. Give this man a break. Okay, Fernando, it's, <laughs> it's all about justice.